What's the worst species in the galaxy? Sentient species, I mean, that you've had to deal with. There's a lot of spacers in here today, and we've all met our fair share of aliens. Hey, there are half a dozen different species in this cafeteria right now, and a few more on this trading post. So in all the galaxy, which sentient species do you want to avoid above all others? Humans? That's the usual answer. They're dangerous, all right. Certainly wouldn't want to get into a fight with one of them. Kalu Kamsku? Pain in the hindquarters to communicate with, and if you do get through to them, their answer is likely to be, we're doing this whether you like it or not. Get out of our way. Then there are the Grisk, the Upau Rokvau, and the Ashoa, the extremophile species. It's hard to find common ground with people who breathe methane or require an ambient temperature above the boiling point of water. Well, as a starship captain, I've seen a lot, but it's a big galaxy out there, so take this with a grain of salt. But based on my personal experience and what I've heard in several decades working the deep space routes, I'd say the absolute worst species in the galaxy, the ones you really don't want to come across, are the Stat Stan. You weren't expecting that, were you? The Statstan aren't known for being particularly dangerous. They have the same environmental requirements as the majority of sentient species, and they negotiate and trade with the rest of the galaxy without too much trouble. In the grand scheme of things, they fit in fairly well to the pan-galactic community of star-faring species. Well, all that's true. But let me tell you, they're no one, anywhere in the known universe, who is so relentlessly untrustworthy. Less common sense than a fledgling, too, but it's the total lack of scruples that gets you. Yeah, yeah, laugh all you want. I know they're not very intimidating. Certainly not compared to humans or even most other sentient species in the galaxy. A meter and a half tall at most, no natural weaponry or armor, just insulating fur and a pair of short tusks they usually file down anyway. They spend most of their time hanging upside down by their tails. Not aggressive, either. Not the type to start a fight. But that doesn't mean they can't get you killed. I have a nestkin who served on a freighter who told me this story, that he got from a cook on a scout ship who got it from a trading post on Tamiarai. And for years I didn't believe it, until I met someone from the crew it happened to, in a cafeteria not too different from the one we're in now, on the trading post orbiting Eos. You know how it is. You get a couple of deep spacers together, and sooner or later someone asks, What's the craziest thing you've seen out there? Well, someone asked, and this guy starts going on and on about this one time his ship answered a distress call from some Statstan. An Amia ship, by the way. This guy was as Amia as I am, and I still didn't believe him. Thought he'd been letting his fruit punch ferment a little too long, if you know what I mean. I'd already heard the story so many times, I thought it was just an urban legend he was trying to pass off as his own. But when I told him as much, he didn't get offended, he gave me a look that said, yeah, no one ever believes me. I almost left, but something about that look. So I told him, prove it if you can. Well, he took me back to his ship and he showed me the logs. That shut me up right enough. It had all of it, vid footage, log entries, even the IDs of the crewmen involved. Although for privacy's sake, I'll name no names. So I swear on my mother's beak, what I'm about to tell you is a true story. It started with a distress call. They were a transport ship. The Light Feather, it's a common enough name. No harm in telling you that. On a mission to bring a couple of million tons of seed stock and dried fruit to the research cities on Miyayan 4. Three months into a four-month journey, and they were well beyond the high-traffic shipping routes, and it had been more than a week since they'd even picked up another ship on long-range scans. Then something came in over the comms. A call for help. Well, not even that, just a code from the UCS book. Universal communication standards for you non-spacers listening. Signaling a ship in distress and in need of assistance, plus their coordinates. Regulations said they had to render aid to any ship in trouble if possible. So the light feather changed course to investigate. The captain was an old spacer. He'd spent years at a time in the deep black, so he'd never have left a ship stranded even without regulations. But when they got into sensor range and they saw who had sent the distress call, he almost turned the ship around. Because he was an old spacer, he knew trouble when he saw it. The signal had come from a Statstan city ship. The Statstan are more social than most species, among their own kind, that is. And they don't like to leave their homeworld without a large number of other Statstan around them. And I mean a large number. 
Their smallest ships hold several thousand, and the city ships run up to several million. This one was on the smaller side, a little under five kilometers long, probably a long-range exploration vessel. So its crew was only around a hundred thousand. The crew of the Light Feather numbered a whole twenty-three, all of them Amia mind, so worth two or three of any other species. Joke, joke, no need to get your feathers ruffled, or whatever it is your species ruffles. But still, not much help to a ship of that size and they didn't know what the Statston thought they were going to be able to do for them. The Statston hailed them as soon as they were within range. It was clear that they were desperate. Large sections of their ship had lost life support, and they'd retreated into their central nest chambers. The life support systems in those areas were struggling to keep the air scrubbed and the temperature down. They still had FTL, but this far out they wouldn't reach a habitable world in time. It wouldn't be long before they had nowhere left to go. They wanted to abandon ship, all 100,000 of them. They'd given up trying to fix their system, so they'd decided their only option was to hitch a ride with someone else. The Light Feather was a large freighter, a kilometer and a half long, so technically, technically, it had the space to take them, if it dumped its cargo. But it would have been cramped as hell, and jury-rigging life support to accommodate an extra 100,000 life forms wasn't likely to end any better than leaving the Statston where they were so the captain decided he had to turn them down. But because regulations and his conscience said he had to give them any help he could, he offered to send his engineers over to take a look at their systems, see if there were any repairs they could make, or any spare parts on the light feather that might be useful. The thing about the Stat Stan is, they don't have a conscience. I mean that in the most literal sense, they're biologically amoral. It isn't normally an issue because normally outsiders deal with them only in a limited set of circumstances for which there are prearranged rules. The Statston understand rules. They like rules, and they'll follow them to the letter. If you want to trade with them, or negotiate with them, or just pay them a visit, then so long as you agree a framework for your meeting beforehand, you should be fine. But if there was no rule against it, and the Statston thought they might gain some advantage by it, then they would happily kill you and not spare it a second thought. They're not an aggressive species, mind. Far from it, their instinctive response to stress is to climb up somewhere high and curl into a ball. So there's little danger of them attacking you. But you'd want to think very carefully before going aboard their ship and putting yourself in their hands. Of course, both the Amia and the Statston are ancient spacefaring species, and a protocol for answering distress signals had been negotiated long ago. The captain of the Light Feather took a moment to familiarize himself with the procedures, but it seemed like it covered everything he could think of. Even so, before he left the ship, he gave clear instructions to the crew who were staying. If they lost contact with the rescue party, they weren't to send more people over to find out what happened. They were to send out their own distress call right away. Twelve Amia went over to the stricken city ship, the captain, the safety officer, the medic, plus the nine engineers to see what they could do for the life support systems. The first mate and cargo specialists stayed behind along with three of the engineers. If anything did happen, the captain wanted to make sure the light feather could get home again. Statston ships aren't complicated. Two-kilometer diameter habitation sphere at the front, connected by a thin spine to the main reactor and the engines at the back. The captain decided to dock the shuttle at an airlock halfway along the spine. The city ship's shuttle bay was functional, but rather than make space on their ships for hangars, the Statston dismantle their shuttles after use and store the components separately. They're a technologically sophisticated species, and their auto factories can assemble and disassemble small craft almost as quickly as they could move a shuttle from hangar to launch bay, provided the components are available. It's efficient and it means they can customize shuttles for the specific circumstances. The captain didn't know how familiar they were with Amiya Tech, and he didn't want to take the chance that they wouldn't be able to put his shuttle back together. That, and he wanted to know there was a shuttle there waiting for him the moment he decided to leave. A delegation of Statston met them at the airlock, about 50 of them, because in a group any smaller than that, they'd start having panic attacks. Have you ever seen a Statston in person? You'd never see them in a place like this. They like to stay with their own kind. Don't often see them fraternizing with other species. I've met a couple over the years. They're shorter than Amia. 
and they only have three limbs compared to our twelve. Yes, twelve, not six. Aliens describe us as having one pair of arms, wings, and legs each, but our secondary wings count as separate limbs. The Statston are tripodal, so on the ground they amble along using their two long forelimbs and a pad at the base of their tail. But they're an arboreal species, so they're more comfortable climbing, where they can use their long prehensile tail. Four eyes, two forward-facing and two on each side of their head, all in all not too unusual by the standards of the whole galaxy. Their diet on their homeworld is exclusively nutrient-rich sap from the trees they live in. Triangular mouth with two tusks to strip away bark, most statston who live in space file these down for convenience. They have a really long tongue for rooting for sap, which limits the sounds they can make, but their language is still mostly vocalizations, with a few gestures. Not intimidating, not even particularly alien-looking, in a galaxy that includes species like the Upau Rokvau. All in all, you'd be forgiven for thinking they couldn't be a danger even if they wanted to be. But don't trust them. It'll come back to bite you, and with sharp teeth. Life support in the spine was out too, so everyone was wearing spacesuits. Amiya suits are red for visibility, while the Statston were in mottled green and brown, same colors as their fur. Since the captain had dealt with the Statston before he was expecting them to be in a large group, what he wasn't expecting was that they'd all be armed. Well, armed? They were holding arc welders, laser cutters, industrial solder machines, and gas sprayers. But that was just engineering equipment, right? All perfectly normal tools for a maintenance team expecting to do some heavy-duty repairs. But they way they were holding them. The captain decided he was just being paranoid. Whatever else they might be, the Statston weren't violent. Whatever had happened to their ship, it had screwed up their system so thoroughly they didn't even have lighting. Which, by the way was the first topic of discussion. What exactly had happened to their ship? After all, it was five kilometers long. It should take a hell of a lot of punishment to knock out life support like this. But there was not sign of external damage. Unexpected malfunction of the environmental controls was all they would say. The engine section, the spine, and the outer layers of the primary hull had all been rendered uninhabitable. Only the inner core of the sphere, the large chambers where the Statstan put their nests and nurseries were still occupied. But with over a hundred thousand individuals crammed in there, the oxygen was dropping fast and the heat was rising. The captain pressed for details, of course, but they just kept saying, unexpected malfunction of the environmental controls. The fourth time they repeated the exact same words, the captain checked his translation software to see if it was glitching, but no. They just wouldn't give any more information. He tried to press them, but no one was talking, and trying to work out who was in charge was pointless. The Statston don't have leaders. They do their decision-making by mutual agreement. I heard a theory from a xenopsychologist once that this is the reason they often seem to have no common sense. They evolved to live in much smaller groups, but their social instinct is so strong that when they developed the technology to support larger populations, it drove them to build larger and larger communities, well past what they were psychologically prepared to deal with. In their native habitat, every so often a Statston would have to make an individual decision. But when you've got a hundred thousand others around you, decision-making is always someone else's problem. The Statston seem to have decided to take the rescue team to the nearest control node for the life support systems, which was in the habitat sphere. Fortunately, there was enough power in the spine that they could run the transport pods. The reactors were still online and primary systems were functioning. It was only the life support that was out. Which was weird because normally life support is designed to be the last thing to fail. The transport pod took them to the right level, but then there was about 200 meters of corridor to the node. 200 meters with no cover in the dark. If you're not a Mia, you won't understand this, but we hate spending long periods in spacesuits. Can't use our wings, it's like a straitjacket. You learn to deal with it, of course, if you're in the deep space industry. But not being able to fly for cover, well, the rescue team was already nervous and that didn't make it any better. And what made the captain even more nervous was that the Statston escorting them seemed to be nervous too. The group kept shifting around them as the individuals on the edge tried to get on the inside, and the ones then left, exposed, 
tried to shuffle back towards the middle. All the while, holding their tools like they were expecting to do some surprise repairs any moment. Being tripods, it's not easy for them to walk and hold stuff at the same time. But the Statston were not letting go of their equipment. The captain checked a couple of the vents used for atmosphere regulation along the way. They weren't working, obviously, but there was no sign why, like ash from an out-of-control fire. Then they came across a robot, looming in the darkness, wide enough that it almost filled the corridor, and the corridor was big enough to accommodate large groups of Statston passing through. It was obviously junk now, bits and pieces of it all over the place. The captain asked about it, but all the escorts would say was that it was a repair drone that had malfunctioned. They got to the life support node without any trouble, though, which was a relief. You know what the Statston said then? They said, look at the node and see repairs to life support are not possible. Evacuation is necessary. They hadn't ever intended to fix anything, just proved to the crew of the Light Feather that their ship was beyond repair and they needed a ride. The captain, of course, wasn't having any of that. He told his engineers to do everything they could think of to bring the damaged node back online. Meanwhile, they waited in the dark, airless corridor. And while they were waiting for the Light Feather's engineers to assess the damage, the captain noticed that one of the Statston was holding a scanner. Well, he'd noticed it already, but he'd thought it was just to plot the safest route to the node, avoiding any sections with high radiation or busted plasma conduits or something dangerous like that. So why was he still holding it? And why was he still paying extremely close attention to it? The corridor must not have been in total vacuum because the captain's suit picked up the sound from the scanner. Faint, but unmistakable. Definitely some kind of alert. The change in the Statston was immediate. They started to bunch together even tighter, crowding round the nodes so that the engineers working there had to start physically shoving them away. More than a couple of the Statston were trying to climb up onto the ceiling, but although there were handholds there, as there are on every surface on a Statston ship, it didn't accomplish much. The corridor wasn't very high, so when they hung down by their tails, their faces were level with head height for an Amiya, and were not exactly tall ourselves, around a meter seventy usually. The captain could pick up their radio emissions, but they were on a scrambled channel so he couldn't tell what they were saying to each other. They were definitely talking about something, though. He asked, but all they said was, hazard detected. Another dozen escorts climbed onto the ceiling. The captain was about to tell the engineers to pack up their gear because it was definitely time to get the hell out of there. But before he could give the order, one of the engineers reported back. The damage was deliberate. Not the result of an overload or a malfunctioning control system. The only way it could have been done was if someone was trying to take out life support. It was sabotage. Ping. Yeah, the scanner was still making noises, and it was only speeding up. The captain was about to tell the escorts that they were leaving, but again, he was beaten to the punch. Environmental hazard detected. Area no longer safe, were the words they used. If it was an environmental hazard, then the captain was a velian giant porcupine. But so long as the Statston wanted to get out of there, he wasn't about to argue. The Statston quickly hustled them back the way they came. The captain made sure he was the last of his crew to leave. And just before he got out of there, he took one look back down the corridor. His suit lamps didn't cast much light. But right at the edge of their range, he thought he saw, just for a second, a flicker of movement. When I say the Statston got out of there quickly, I mean quickly. Some of them were still loping along the ground, but a lot of them had slung their tools on their backs and were swinging from the ceiling holds. We, Amia, aren't exactly graceful on foot, but with wings not an option, the rescue party from the Light Feather set new records for Amia runners. One of the engineers panicked and tried to use his suit jets, which are what the suits are designed for, but not in a confined space, smacked his head on the ceiling, had to be carried back to the transport pod. Except the transport pod wasn't there. There was just an empty tunnel. By this point, the captain had had more than enough. While the medic saw to the injured engineer, he grabbed the nearest of their escort group. Now I said the Statston aren't intimidating, but neither are we, Amia, particularly. When you're in the guano, needs must, however, the captain gave it his best shot, drew himself up to his full height, fluffed up his feathers, 
not that it made a difference in the suit. And he made sure that the Statston knew that when he said he wanted answers, he was serious about it. Malfunction in the transport protocols was what they told him. Well, you can bet that didn't go down well. The captain was not fresh out of the egg, and he knew there was more going on here than the furry little liars were letting on. So he threatened to tell the Lightfeather to leave, abandon both the rescue party and the stat stan, unless they started giving him the truth. And he made sure they knew that if his comms were cut, the Lightfeather would leave anyway. You know what their answer to that was? The treaties between the Amia and the Statstan oblige you to render aid to a ship in distress, because that's how they think. Rules say the Amia have to help, so they have to help. Never mind that any sentient with the slightest trace of self-preservation instinct would be running for the nearest airlock at this point, treaty or no treaty. Never mind that the Statstan have been lying their fuzzy behinds off all this time. If that's what's in the manual, then that's what you do. They couldn't grasp the idea that anyone would say the hell with the rules, no matter what the circumstances. Well, the captain had a comeback for that. The treaty says the Amia have to render aid where possible. And by withholding information, the Stadstan had made it impossible for the captain to asses the situation accurately and decide the best course of action. As captain, his first duty was to the safety of his ship. Until they told him what the hell was going on, he wasn't going to risk putting the light feather in danger. He could see they were debating amongst themselves, even though he didn't have access to their private channels to know what they were saying. Then he saw the amount of EM signals his suit was picking up, and he realized that it wasn't just the 50 individuals in the corridor with him. It was the entire ship. All the 100,000 Statston aboard were arguing over what to do next. Each one, no doubt, wanting to voice their opinion without taking any responsibility for the result. Just throwing out ideas and letting the most popular percolate to the top of the gestalt, no matter if it made sense or not. Just so long as it stayed within the rules, it couldn't be wrong. No wonder they were in such a mess. Or as we Amia put it, right above the guano pool with a broken wing. Did I say the captain was done with their shenanigans? He was well past done. He sent a quick private message to warn his crew that he was going offline for a few minutes. Then he jury-rigged his suit radio to flood all frequencies at once. That got their attention. The captain dialed up his speakers to maximum to cut through the thin atmosphere and prayed the Statstan's audio receivers had translation software. The Statstan were just about having a panic attack. Now they were cut off from all their friends, so they actually seemed relieved to hear him speak. The first thing he told them was to stop asking the whole ship for advice, because those Statston in the Habitat Corps were not the ones who were going to die if things out here took a nosedive. The second thing he told them was it was time to tell the truth, starting with what happened to the transport pod and working backwards. There was still some chatter between the 50 Statston in the corridor with them but it seemed like without the rest of their city ship trying to butt in on the conversation, they were more rational, because they answered, Transport Pod was withdrawn to maintain quarantine. Yeah, that's right, quarantine. As you can imagine, the captain's gizzard just about dropped out of his boots when he heard that. And the natural follow-up question was, quarantine of what? The story that followed was a little garbled because there were ten individual Statston trying to tell him the same things all at once. But the gist of it was clear. There was an alien life form aboard the city ship. What kind of life form? Where did it come from? All they would say was, species unknown, origin unknown. Whatever it was, wherever they'd picked it up, once it was on board, it started killing. The Statston responded fairly logically at first. They're a technologically advanced species. They should be able to handle a rogue xenoform. So they modified some of their repair bots to carry impromptu weaponry. Their internal sensors aren't set up to monitor anything more than environmental data for the life support systems, so they couldn't track whatever it was accurately. But they could narrow it down to certain sections. They evacuated the affected areas and sent the AI-controlled repair bots in to sweep and sterilize. The rescue party had already seen the results of that. Dozens of repair bots were torn apart before the Statstan gave up. The repair bots just weren't designed to take that kind of punishment, and it was clear that the modifications they could make on the city ship weren't going to cut it. 
That left them no choice but to do the job themselves. They printed themselves weaponry, based on their existing inventory of industrial tools and modified scanners to pick up trace changes in air currents and electrical potential. Motion detectors. They geared up and formed teams of no less than a hundred each to comb the ship for the alien intruder. The hope was that in large enough groups, numbers and firepower would overcome ferocity. The alien had torn them apart, literally. It was large enough and strong enough to rip a Statston's arms off, and it was fast, too. It always seemed to appear out of nowhere, and it was gone just as quickly. The other Statston would pick up the panicked chatter from the group under attack, but by the time help arrived, all that was left was body parts and burn marks on the walls from weapons that hit nothing. Usually a few Statstan got away. They knew how to run and hide on their own ship, at least. But they were never in a condition to give any useful information afterwards. At this point, the Statston had started to panic. They withdrew the search teams and evacuated everyone to the inner core. Then, they did the only thing they could think of to do. Go back to the rule book. The protocol for dealing with infestation by an alien organism was mostly made with microbes in mind, and included, as a last resort, cutting life support in contaminated sections. Less effective when your target can move between different parts of the ship. But if you cut everything all at once... With everyone in the inner chambers, they opened the entire outer layer of the habitat sphere and the spine and the engines to hard vacuum. It had totally failed. Whatever was out there could survive in the void. Of the first scout team to sweep the outer sphere after they repressurized everything, only 10% made it back alive. Utterly desperate now, the Statstan had started pushing their life support system to the limit, trying every combination of temperature, pressure, and gravity they could think of in an attempt to kill the hostile organism infesting their ship. The problem with this was that generally the whole point of a life support system is to not let the environment get too far outside the norm. So they'd had to bypass or disable a lot of the safety protocols, and even then the equipment could only be pushed so far beyond its baseline function but they managed to get the temperature up to halfway between the freezing and boiling point of water at varying levels of atmospheric pressure. They also managed to get their artificial gravity up to as high as 10 Gs above standard. But this still didn't manage to kill the alien, unbelievably. In the end, all they accomplished was to completely trash their life support. So they were now sitting in a ship whose last remaining life support systems were failing, with an unkillable alien predator loose on board. They'd let the crew of the Light Feather come over on a mission of mercy and led them right into the heart of the hunting ground. All without mentioning any of these details. Now do you see my point? Statstan are the worst. There were a lot of things the captain would have liked to say to the Statstan at that moment, but none of them would have been helpful, nor repeatable in public for that matter. The most important thing in that moment was to get out of there, and for that, he needed the Statstan's cooperation. He still had a nasty feeling there were more details they were leaving out. For a start, he didn't believe for a second that they had no idea where they could have picked up the creature, but they'd said all they were going to say, and he couldn't stand around interrogating them any longer. He tried to convince them to bring the transport pod back, but the Statstan with him didn't have access to the controls, and they made it very clear that the others weren't going to send the pod back while there was any chance the alien was nearby. Their only chance was to make it to the next section. The Statstan designed their ships with airtight modules in case of a hull breach. If they made it to the next one, they could close the bulkheads and hopefully seal themselves off from whatever was hunting them. Unfortunately, the alien had shown a remarkable capacity to find ways to get from section to section in the past. They'd had to physically weld all the doors of the inner habitat sphere shut to keep it out, with the exception of one transport line heavily guarded to allow maintenance teams in and out. But they might be able to slow it down long enough to call a transport pod and get out of there. The captain finally dropped the EM jamming and gave the crew back on the light feather an update on the situation. He made it clear that under no circumstances were they to dock with the city ship, and if the Statstan tried to send a shuttle over, they were to jump to FTL immediately. He made sure the Statstan could hear that part. 
Then he switched to a private channel and had a conversation with the rest of his rescue party. The medic had got the injured engineer back on his feet. No concussion, just stunned and bruised. He'd have advised the engineer to avoid stress for a while, but under the circumstances, the safety officer thought they should abandon the whole mission. The captain wasn't quite ready to leave a 100,000 sentients to die, but then again, the Statstan's problems could wait until all his team were back on the light feather. The Statstan, meanwhile, were having a discussion of their own. Or an argument, rather. Seemed like the others weren't happy that the escorts had let slip their little secret. They're not like the Kalu Kamsku. They knew full well they should have disclosed the danger to the light feather. They just didn't want to risk the Amiya not helping them. They were very clear on what they wanted to happen now, though, and the escorts relayed the results of their deliberations to the rescue team. Evacuate the city ship, then overload the reactors. Result? Thermonuclear explosion. It's the only way to be sure. The captain actually liked the idea of nuking the Statston ship a whole lot at this point, but the problem was carrying out an evacuation without giving the alien a chance to board the light feather. They could cross that branch when they got to it, though. Right now, getting the hell out of there was their top priority. Unfortunately, that meant making their way through several hundred meters of pitch black corridors. The only idea the captain liked the sound of less was staying right where they were. The motion detector hadn't made any noise for a while. Maybe the alien had decided that with 12 Amiya among the 50 Statstan, the odds were against it. Or maybe it just wasn't moving. The captain cast one last look down the corridor, but his suit lights didn't show much. If there was something out there, waiting, well, either way, it didn't make a difference. They were putting as much distance between themselves and this section as possible. They took a left and followed the monorail for the transport pods a little way before it disappeared into a tunnel. The escorts advised against following it. Once you were in the tunnel, there was no way out until you got to the other end. So they took another left, which led them through a corridor where the artificial gravity was malfunctioning. The Amiya, of course, were fairly comfortable with weightlessness, but the Statstan did not take well to bobbing about and would only proceed clinging to the walls and ceiling. This slowed them down a lot. Ping. The captain tensed up. What he wouldn't have given for something thick and heavy to hide under at that moment. But he had a duty to his crew, and hiding wasn't going to do them any good here anyway. They had to make it to the next section and seal the bulkheads. Ping. At least the Statston were moving faster now. They were clumsy in the low gravity, but although a couple of them lost their grip and bounced off the floor, they kept going. Ping. There was definitely something behind them, moving fast, closing on them, but they still had time. Ping. The captain turned, trying to see where it was. His suit lights glanced across the walls, floor, ceiling, but they didn't show him anything but an empty corridor ping. They were almost at the end of the corridor. It couldn't be that much further to the next section. Ping. The captain checked all his crew were ahead of him. Ping. They were at the end of the corridor. All of them. The gravity was back. This part still had power. They were at a four-way intersection, and the Statston had paused, trying to work out which fork to take. The motion sensor wasn't picking up anything. Maybe whatever was following them didn't like low gravity. Crash. The captain spun round, just in time to see a vent cover slam to the ground. Something dropped from the shaft right into the middle of them. The captain just caught a glimpse of it in the light of someone else's suit lamps. Whatever it was, it was fast and it was bone white. Everyone panicked. Some of the Statston dived for cover. Some brought their weapons up. The ones who fled were the smart ones. In all the chaos, the captain couldn't keep track of the white blur, but he saw a Statstan go flying and hit the wall, hard. Every radio channel was filled with shouting, screaming. It was just as well atmospheric pressure was low, muffling the sound of 50 Statstan shrieking in alarm. Several of the Amiya tried to activate their suit jets on instinct. One or two got clear, but the captain saw a couple of his crew smack into the ceiling or bounce off the walls. The safety officer kept his cool, like he'd been trained to, and retreated back into zero-G section, where an Amiya would have an advantage. The medic managed not to panic as well, and made for an engineer who'd been knocked down. The creature grabbed him, 
Through the mess of flailing Statstan and Amia, the captain just managed to catch a glimpse of a red suit being dragged into a ventilation shaft. Then it was over. The whole encounter had lasted less than 30 seconds. Slowly, the panic died down, at least enough for the captain to check that the rest of his team were all right. Everyone accounted for, except for the medic, of course, and with nothing worse than a bruise or two. The Statstan weren't so lucky. Three of them were dead. Two from blunt force trauma and one from having its arm pulled clean out of its socket. There was no use mourning them now, however. The creature could be back at any moment. The captain hesitated, but he still had ten members of his crew he needed to get to safety. The medic would understand. The next section was only 150 meters away. Left, right, left again. All the time waiting for the motion detector to go off again. But nothing happened. And suddenly they were there. Safety. Still, the captain didn't let himself relax until the heavy vacuum-proof doors closed. It was only then that he thought to check the bio-monitors in his crew's suits. He wanted to make sure that the injured weren't seriously hurt. The bio-monitors were fairly basic and no substitute for a full exam, but it was better than nothing. Fortunately, their vital signs were all within normal tolerances. They'd been knocked about a bit, but they'd be fine. However, when the captain opened the display on his suit's visor, he noticed something else. The medic was still alive. He ran a diagnostic, making sure that he was still looking at current data and it wasn't on some sort of time delay. Nope. This was the current telemetry. The medic was definitely still alive. His vital signs were still strong, too. The captain then brought up a map. Every suit had a tracker in it and the medics was still broadcasting. He wasn't even that far away, only a few hundred meters and two levels up. The captain thought long and hard about what he was going to do next. When things get tough, you don't abandon your flock. Every Amia is raised knowing that. However, when you get older, get given a position of responsibility, you learn that things aren't always that simple. There are always risks when you're out in deep space, but they're usually risks like a malfunctioning reactor or a toxic leak from the cargo. Pulling a crewmate out of a burning engine room was brave, but taking on an alien predator? That was just crazy. He was only a freighter captain. He wasn't some long-range explorer. He didn't sign up to go boldly into the unknown, and he certainly didn't sign up to fight monsters. The sensible thing to do would be to make sure the rest of his crew was safe and accept that there was nothing he could do for the medic now. But he was still a captain, and when he took the job, he accepted responsibility for everyone under his command. He'd told the Statstan that his first duty was to the safety of his ship. That was important, sure. They needed those supplies on Miayan 4, but above all else, as captain, it was his duty to make sure his crew got home again. All of them. After a quick conversation with the safety officer, the captain made his decision. The Statstan were surprised when he told them there was a change of plans, but not half as much as the rest of the Amia. It took some arguing, but in the end they agreed. They would continue on to the transport pod and take the rest of the team back to the Lightfeather's shuttle. The captain and the safety officer would go back for the ship's medic. The Statstan didn't like anyone making a decision without consulting, well, everyone. But they also didn't care if two Amia wanted to get themselves killed. They left him one of the motion detectors and continued on escorting the rest of the rescue team to the transport pod. Once they'd gone, the safety officer got the stunners out of his pack. There are always two on a freighter with a crew of four or more, and only the captain and the safety officer are trained to use them. Long sticks that fire an electrical pulse. Simple weapons, but effective. If one of the crew has a psychotic episode, and it can happen out in the void, then the stunners allow his shipmates to subdue him without hurting him. Much. It's designed to be non-fatal, but it still hurts like hell. Normally, the captain would never have brought weapons on board someone else's ship, especially not without asking them first. But this was the stat stun they were dealing with, and he'd had a feeling they were hiding something. He told the security officer to bring the stunners, keep them hidden, and only use them as a last resort. This seemed like a last resort. As they waited by the door dividing the sections, he tried raising the medic on comms a couple of times. Nothing. It occurred to the captain that even if the creature hadn't eaten him already, it probably wasn't doing anything pleasant with him. 
but his vital signs were still strong, and as long as that green line held, then there was still hope. After a few minutes, the door opened. The captain breathed a sigh of relief. Whatever else happened, the others had reached the transport pod. He looked at the safety officer without even needing to say it. You don't have to do this, you know. But the safety officer was through the door before the captain. It was his job to identify potential hazards to the crew and keep them out of harm's way. He'd been trained to keep a cool head under pressure. Maybe no one had ever expected a situation like this when they were giving him that training, but this was definitely a hazard, and there was a crewman in harm's way. They retraced their steps and found an access shaft that allowed them to go up two levels using their jets. Then they started following the medic's tracker beacon. The captain kept a close eye on the motion sensor, but it was quiet as, well, as the grave. One intersection, two, three. They crept down the empty corridors, suit lamps piercing through the darkness and found nothing. They were getting close. The medic must be somewhere along the next corridor. That came from behind them. The captain spun round, but once again, all he saw was an empty corridor. The motion sensor was definitely picking up something in the direction they'd just come. The captain and the safety officer looked at each other. Then they broke into a run. The medic's suit tracker was still registering just a little way ahead. The creature must have stashed him for later and then gone out to hunt down the rest of their group. Maybe they still had a chance. Get in, get the medic, and get out before the creature realized they'd doubled back. The captain's legs were starting to hurt. He wasn't used to using them for so long, but it couldn't be far now. Suddenly, the safety officer stuck his arm out, bringing him to a halt, and in an instant, the captain saw why. There was a hatch there, not a large one, like the section divider, so there was probably just a small room through there. From the position of beacon on the medic's suit, he must be just on the other side, the captain hesitated. You never opened a door on a spacecraft if you didn't know what it led to. Dangerous machinery, radiation, anything. If the atmospheres weren't equalized, and that was a real danger on this ship, they could be blown back into the wall behind them. The captain sprang forward and pressed the button. The door swished open. Instantly, the captain knew two things. The first was that he should never have trusted the Statston when they told him there was only one intruder aboard. The second was that they were as good as dead. His wings flexed inside his suit, trying to fly for cover. The captain half turned, but when his wings just hit the inside of his suit, it shocked him enough to think about what he was doing. There was no cover here, but he had the stunner. The captain brought up his weapon and depressed the firing button. Too slow, far too slow. His target was already moving. The safety officer fired, but he missed too. The captain adjusted his aim, already knowing it was futile, already knowing what was coming at him, but he had to try. He was just about to press the firing button again when the stunner was ripped out of his hand. The safety officer lost his weapon a split second later. Then they were just standing there, face to face with it. A human. The safety officer half turned, instinct finally winning out, then just collapsed. Adrenaline faint. When an Amiya's panic instinct activates, but they can't use that burst of energy to fly to cover, it often causes an overload that knocks them out. Saves you from having a heart attack but not great in a dangerous situation. Right then, however, the captain envied him. No one could survive a human, not in any kind of combat, and certainly not up close like this. They still weren't well known outside their little corner of the galaxy, but the Amiya had investigated and gathered a certain amount of information on them. Carnivorous, aggressive, brutally strong, fast, and tough. Insane predatory instinct, to the point where they frequently hunted each other, as well as anything else that came within reach. The Amiya government had sent observers in during the conflict with the Kalukamsku, and what they'd brought back. Well, the captain had seen some of the vids. Whatever the human was about to do to him, he just hoped it was quick. It was just standing there. It was wearing a white spacesuit, not too different from the captain's own, although obviously made to fit a human form. A little taller than him, but much bulkier. Most ground-dwelling species are, of course. Flight is a huge advantage for the EMEA, but it does mean we're relative lightweights for our size. The captain was fairly confident that if it wanted to, the human could rip his limbs off one by one, then fold him in half for good measure. But it was just standing there. 
The captain became aware of a presence behind him. Something picked him up and the safety officer and shoved them both into the room. Then the door closed with a hiss of finality. Two humans. Now he was in an enclosed space with two humans. He caught a flash of movement at the corner of his vision and a third human came into view. All three were wearing bone-white spacesuits that to an Amia looked disturbingly skeletal. They were all just standing there. This was what he got for trusting the Statstan. The captain realized there was only one thing left for him to do now. He opened his comm system to tell the light feather to pick up the rest of the crew, then get as far away from here as possible. Then he noticed that there was an alert on his comm system. It was picking up a signal on a new frequency. Almost on reflex, the captain selected it. An audio transmission, or at least that was what it looked like. He opened it. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Can your translation matrix process this? Yeah, that's right, they were trying to talk to him. You can imagine how shocked the captain was. Could have knocked him down with a feather, as we Amiya say. The only sentient predator species in the galaxy, and instead of trying to eat him, they were trying to talk to him. Which was when it dawned on him, they're sentient. They may be carnivorous, but they're sentient. Maybe, just maybe, there was a chance for him to talk his way out of this. So he replied, Yes, I can understand you. He wanted to add, please don't eat me. But he didn't fully trust his translation program to deal with human language. And even with perfect translation, there's still the chance of cultural misunderstandings. So he decided to stay away from the whole topic of killing him and keep everything simple. He started by asking, what do you want? The answer surprised him almost as much as the fact that he was still alive. He followed up with another question and another, and slowly he started to get an idea of what was really going on here. It had all started a few weeks earlier. A human cargo ship called the Idaho had been on a mission out to Uparokvau territory. Just an ordinary trade run, except not ordinary for humans, because that's a hell of a long way for them. Their FTL drives are pretty primitive, and they have very few ships capable of crossing that kind of distance. They were four months into the trip when their FTL drive broke down far, far beyond the range of any possibility that another human ship would come across them. So they sent out a general distress call. And guess who answered? That's right, the Statston city ship. Now, if you or I answered a distress signal, it would be because we actually wanted to help. But that's not how the Statston think. They found the Idaho drifting, helpless, and they checked its configuration against the list of species they have bilateral agreements with. Not Amia, not Velian, not Tok Tok. In fact, the ship design was one they'd never encountered before. The files said, Human. Don't think the Statstaan didn't know what a human was. They exchange information with the rest of the galaxy. Their databases contain as much information on all the various spacefaring species as anyone, even the obscure ones. But they'd never encountered humans directly before, which meant they didn't have any treaties with them, which meant they had no obligation to help. A species which had the tiniest sliver of an instinct for compassion would have thought to themselves, well, we can't just leave them out here. We have to do something for them. A species which had any amount of common sense would have thought, maybe we should stay away from a ship full of humans. But these are the Statstan we're talking about. So they thought, hey, nice free ship, that's right. Those geniuses found a human disabled ship, and they decided to just take it for themselves, a human ship. I told you the first time I heard this story, I didn't believe it. Because surely, surely, even the Statstan aren't that stupid. But apparently they are. I saw the logs and I still can barely believe it, but they really are that dumb. The city ship dragged the Idaho into its shuttle bay and the auto factory started carving it up. Keep in mind, the humans thought up till this point that the Statstan were coming to help them. Nasty surprise for them. Although the Statstan were about to have a worse one. As the industrial cutters started slicing into their hull, they had to scramble for their spacesuits and make a run for the emergency airlocks. Eleven of them didn't make it. The other 38, however, got off their ship in time before it was torn apart for components. I guess the Statstan just assumed that anyone on board the ship would die as they were taking it apart, and they wouldn't have to worry about them. But 38 humans managed to evacuate and found an opening that led them into the machinery of the auto factory. And somehow, they made it through without getting crushed or cut up, and activated an airlock. 
It didn't take the Statston long to realize that they'd picked up passengers. At first, they tried to deal with the humans by containing them, but humans are a reasonably intelligent species, and the Statston like to keep their ships simple. The humans quickly worked out they could move through the ventilation system, and given enough time, they could break open the door controls and bypass the lockouts. From there, it progressed more or less as the Statston had told the Amia earlier. First, they sent in the modified repair drones. These huge, lumbering robots actually managed to kill three of the humans, partly because the humans still weren't sure what was going on and whether it was just an interspecies misunderstanding. I should mention, by the way, that the crew of the Idaho wasn't part of the human hunter caste. They're military. Well, their captain and two of the crew were ex-military, but all the rest were considered non-combatants by human standards. They were ordinary space freight workers like us, pilots, navigators, engineers, cargo supervisors. They were as unprepared as humans get to face lethal violence. But these are humans we're talking about. Being humans, they quickly adapted to the new threat trying to exterminate them, because when you live on a world full of humans, there's lethal danger around every corner. Led by their captain, using what he remembered from his military training, they worked out that the drones had blind spots, and although they were powerful, they were slow. The Statston simply weren't used to designing weapons, and soon every drone they sent out was methodically obliterated by a combination of the humans' tactical superiority and their innate, raw aggression. As the humans were explaining this part to the captain of the Light Feather, one of them mentioned that after a while it seemed like a video game boss battle. The drones were much bigger than them, but they had weak spots and they moved predictably. The captain then had to ask them what a video game was, and apparently it's a kind of educational or entertainment simulation humans use. They come in many varieties, and a lot of them aren't too different from our VR sims, but by far the biggest genre is where something horrifying is trying to kill you, and you have to kill them first. They do this for fun, from childhood. Maybe if the Statston had known this, they wouldn't have started sending patrols out to hunt down their unwelcome stowaways. At first, the humans tried to avoid them, but the Statston knew their own ship, and they carefully planned their routes to herd the humans into their line of fire. As lacking in common sense as they are, Statston are still a highly intelligent species, and if you give them a problem they can reduce down to mathematics, they will solve it with no problem. Unfortunately for them, humans don't need complex mathematics to work out a hunting pattern. They do that kind of thing instinctively. They understood what the occupants of the city ship were doing, so they decided to introduce them to some of the basic concepts of human warfare, starting with the ambush. As the captain of the Light Feather listened to the details of what the humans did to the Statstan who were trying to purge them from the city ship, he realized something. They were confused not confused over why the Statstan were trying to kill them like a sane person would be. All their media, from the moment a human first realized there might be other life among the stars, had been preparing them for that. Before first contact, they assumed that alien species would be hostile predators. And because first contact was with the Kalu Kamsku, it persisted for a while after that as well. No, they were confused over why massacring the Statstan had been so easy. It wasn't that the Statston were slow, not like the Kalu Kamsku. The Statston had reaction times almost as fast as a human, and they could move remarkably quickly when they had a handhold overhead to swing from. But when the humans ambushed them, they were useless. Even when they heavily outnumbered their targets. Many would drop their weapons and flee, and the ones that tried to stay and fight were terrible at it. Their aim was all over the place, and as soon as a human got within striking distance, their only defensive move was to curl into a ball. The humans had been expecting that the aliens who destroyed their ship, the aliens who had been relentlessly hunting them down, would be some kind of aggressive super predator. Like, well, humans. They were baffled that their enemy was so harmless. Because civilized species aren't meant to be predators, the captain of the Light Feather wanted to say. That's not how the galaxy is supposed to work. Until humans were discovered, most scientists thought that being an apex predator was antithetical to the social structures necessary for the development of intelligence. 
and it was taken as a given that no species so aggressive that they regularly attacked their own kind could develop the level of technology necessary for interstellar flight. That was in the captain's personal log, by the way. He felt the need to note it down later, what he'd been thinking in that moment. And I'll throw in an observation of my own. Most species are bad at intuiting the path of projectiles. Relatively speaking, throwing things is not an important skill in most evolutionary lineages. But humans have been making projectile weapons since before they even were humans. Their distant ancestors were tying sharp rocks to long poles hundreds of thousands of years earlier. It was practically the first bit of technology they developed. And there was a huge selective pressure to be good at throwing a weapon to kill something at a distance, whether it was a prey animal or another human. So by human standards, every other species has terrible aim, along with being terrible at everything else related to violence. Think about that if you're ever tempted to relax around humans just because you're armed. Anyway, what the captain told actually told the humans was that the Statston had probably assessed their threat level based on the technological sophistication of their vessel. Judging it inferior, they assumed the humans wouldn't be much of a danger. They had no doubt re-evaluated that position by now. After the patrols had failed miserably, the Statston finally resorted to their really badly thought-up abuse of the environmental controls. If the humans hadn't had their spacesuits, this might actually have worked. But as it was, all it did was make them uncomfortable. Five times their standard gravity is survivable for them, apparently. The Statston managed to drive some sections up as high as 10 Gs before they shorted out. Still didn't kill them, even when the Statston made the atmosphere denser and turned the temperature up to the point where it overwhelmed their suit's insulation, it was still within survivable limits. The gravity I can actually understand, given human bone density and musculature, but it turns out they also have remarkable capacity to withstand temperature extremes. Another adaptation for hunting, shedding excess heat faster than their prey. If stabbing, shooting, or clubbing their target didn't work, they could literally exhaust their prey to death. I know I've said this already, but seriously, how stupid do you have to be to pick a fight with a species like that? So the humans had had an unpleasant stay with the Statston, but they were hanging in there. 34 of them were still alive. That's right, 34 humans had been enough for the 100,000 Statston on board to give up and seal themselves off in the habitat core. Then, the humans saw the Light Feathers shuttle dock with the city ship. They'd had weeks to get to know the place by that point, so they'd figured out how to tap into a lot of the systems, including the transportation system, which had allowed them to track the pod to its destination. And so they'd ended up here. It was at this point that the medic, who had suffered an adrenaline faint when he was grabbed, started waking up. When he saw he was surrounded by humans, he almost lost consciousness again. But the captain was able to calm him down enough to explain what was going on. The medic checked on the safety officer, who was also starting to come too. He was fine, but again, it was a nasty shock waking up surrounded by a bunch of humans. Now that the humans had explained the whole debacle to him, the captain was still left with the question, what did they want? More specifically, what did they want with him, his safety officer, and his medic? His range of expected answers was hostage at the good end and lunch at the bad. Because surely, being humans, they were now going to wage a campaign of genocidal extermination against the Statstan. And to be honest, as far as he was concerned, anyone stupid enough to attack a ship full of humans deserved what they got. But no, they just wanted to get off the ship. It was at this point the captain realized something. The human asking most of the questions must be their captain. He might be a human, when you got right down to it, they weren't so different. All he wanted was to get his crew home. The humans had been looking everywhere for a shuttle hangar and found nothing. Because, of course, the Statston don't have shuttle hangers, just storage for parts. Seeing the Light Feathers shuttle dock had finally given them hope that they might be able to escape. The humans were asking him, begging him, to get them off the Statston ship. One captain to another, he couldn't refuse. The humans visible sagged with relief when he told them he'd help. Then they started talking about the best route back to the spine. What to do if they encountered a Statston patrol, and how they might be able to get the rest of the Amia away from the Statston. And the captain finally understood that they thought his group had been captured by the Statston. Looking back, he could see how they'd made that mistake. 
given that the Ami have been escorted around by a large number of relatively heavily armed Statston. The humans also didn't seem to realize just how desperate the Statston were to get rid of them. The captain opened a comm channel to the Statston and asked them if they'd like him to remove the humans from their ship. This caused some confusion. It apparently had never occurred to them that this was an option. It wasn't that they didn't understand that the humans were sentient. They just didn't think such an intensely hostile species would be open to negotiations. Also, the humans were winning. When the Statstan have an advantage over someone, they don't show mercy. They don't even understand the concept of mercy. The humans could have continued until all the Statstan were dead and the city ship was theirs. And from the Statstan point of view, that seemed like the most logical thing to do. Hemmed up in the core of their ship, most of the Statstan wouldn't have lasted much longer. A few could survive a while in suits, but it had already been established that a few Statstan were no match for the humans. It took the captain quite a while to convince the Statstan that the humans were willing to leave with him without further retaliation. When it finally got through to the whole community, the Statstan were more than happy to accept the deal. Not everyone was so pleased. The safety officer objected strongly to the idea of letting a bunch of humans aboard the Light Feather. Even if this situation had completely been the fault of the Statstan, they were still an incredibly dangerous species and could pose a serious threat to the crew and the ship. It was his job to identify potential hazards, of course. But as the discussion continued over their private comm channels, the captain got the impression that most of the crew was just as worried. He thought about it long and hard. Given recent events, he couldn't really argue the humans weren't dangerous. But, in the end, he overruled his crew. He reminded them that regulations obliged them to come to the aid of other spacers in distress. Just because the humans weren't who they originally thought they were here to help didn't mean that didn't still apply. The crew of the Light Feather weren't happy about it, but they just had to live with it. Because for the captain, this was about more than regulations. When you were out in the void, far, far from home, you didn't abandon a fellow sentient in trouble. The captain did ask the Statstan to try rebuilding the Idaho, because it would have solved a lot of problems if he didn't have to take the humans aboard the Light Feather. But human ships are primitive and don't have the modular construction Statstan ships are designed with. The Idaho had been too badly mangled to put it back together again. The Statstan did at least provide an extra shuttle so they could ferry the humans over to the Light Feather faster. They probably would have given them all the shuttles if it had got the humans off their ship a moment sooner. It still took a while for all the humans to get through the kilometers long city ship to the docking ports. They'd made several bases for themselves, scattered across the ship, places where they'd disabled the internal sensors, then used parts stripped from the life support systems to repressurize a room. Some of their oxygen came from storage tanks. Some of it they'd made by collecting ice crystals from the depressurized corridors and splitting it with electricity. They really are resourceful for a technologically backward species. The safety officer raised one last objection before the humans boarded the shuttles. What were they going to eat? The Light Feather still had another month before it reached Mian 4, and it wasn't like they kept a stock of prey animals for the humans to hunt. Unless, of course, you counted the crew. The captain decided to just ask his opposite number from the Idaho how long humans could go without eating. And he was, well, let's say slightly alarmed. When the Idaho's captain told him that three meals a day was standard, a few days without food was doable, and in extremis, a week or two was survivable. But three meals was ideal. The captain started trying to explain the problem, but the humans didn't seem concerned. They said they'd just eat whatever was on board the Light Feather. The captain tried to make them understand that Amia aren't carnivores, and the only available food was fruit. The humans shrugged and told him that would be fine. At this point, the captain opened a comm channel to the Light Feather and asked the first mate to read through whatever they had on humans in the ship's archives. It was supposed to sync with the galactic net every time they were in port. There should be something on human dietary requirements. The first mate got back to him a few minutes later. Apparently, the common image of humans as ravenous carnivores was a little exaggerated. They're omnivores. Yeah, I know. It's almost disappointing when you find out. The only sentient carnivores in the galaxy, and they aren't even real carnivores. Don't get me wrong, they do eat meat. 
lots of it. But they eat a lot of other things, and they can get by without meat for a while. The crew of the Idaho could eat a wide range of foods, including the fruit rations carried by the light feather. It turned out the Amia had even recently started exporting native fruits from home world to the nearest human colonies. The captain admired the courage of the spacers who had the nerve to sign up for that trade route. In fact, it was healthier for humans if they did eat fruit every so often. Their optimum diet was balanced between meat, fruit, vegetables, and grains, but for short periods, they could survive on a much more limited selection. Once the humans were on board, the light feather stuck around a while to help the Statstan repair their life support. As much as the whole crew of the light feather were completely out of sympathy for the Statstan, it still seemed wrong to leave a hundred thousand sentients to die when they could help. Fortunately, it turned out the Statstan hadn't damaged their life support so badly that it couldn't be repaired with some parts from the light feather at least enough for them to survive as far as the next inhabited world. Then, finally, the light feather got underway again, with 34 humans stashed in a spare cargo hold. At first, the light feather's crew kept their distance, and because the captain refused to lock the humans up, there were some tense moments when an Amia ran into a human in the corridor, but after a few days without a sudden dismemberment, everyone started to relax. After a few more days, curiosity won out, and they started getting to know each other better. It turns out that humans are among the few species in the galaxy to have a sense of humor. Most species don't even understand what a joke is, let alone why it's funny to hang a human spacesuit right next to the chief engineer's nest cot while he's sleeping. Not only did they get it, they were willing to join in. A week in and everyone was having so much fun that both captains had to have a joint meeting and tell their respective crews to settle down and be professional. By the time they got to Miain 4, the humans had gone from being terrifying monsters to unwelcome guests to lifelong friends. Some of the Amia had even invited humans to visit them on Homeworld sometime, and they were all agreed that whenever their ships passed through the galaxy's various trading posts at the same time, they'd get together for a drink or a bite to eat in a cafeteria like this. The Amia were a lot more comfortable with that idea now they knew humans could eat fruit like a normal person. When the humans disembarked on Miain 4, which had grudgingly agreed to host them until they could arrange transport home, the captain of the Idaho went to the captain of the Light Feather to thank him. The whole crew of the Idaho owed him, and anything the captain could do for him, he only had to ask. You know what the captain of the Light Feather said? No need. It's what any decent captain would do. And the human understood. Captain to captain and sentient to sentient. So when people tell you that humans are the worst species in the galaxy, don't believe them. Because it's not about how strong a species is or what they eat. It's about whether they understand that when you come across another spacer in trouble, you help them. You don't just leave them, and you certainly don't take advantage of them. Humans understand that, and Statston don't, which is why they're the worst. So have I proved my point? Yeah, I thought so. Usually when I tell that story to spacers, the only complaint they have is that the humans didn't kill enough of the bastards. Answering a distress call just to steal the ship? No spacer would forgive that. Well, before you think the Statston got off easy, when the Light Feathers report got back to Homeworld, our government got together with a few of the Statston's other trading partners, forced them to pay restitution for the loss of the Idaho and the 15 dead crew. Also, well, think about all those weeks the humans spent on the Statston city ship and ask yourselves, what did they eat? Yeah, I know some of you were having lunch. I warned you, we Amia have a sense of humor. The End